guys want to welcome you to the Collective Church. Hey, if you're visiting with us, maybe this is your first, second, third, maybe fourth time here, we just want to thank you so much for being here because here's the truth. You could have been anywhere, but you made the decision to be here. I don't care if you lost the bet. I don't care if somebody forced you to be here. You are here, and that means the absolute world to us. So can we give our first-time guests a round of applause? And you'll notice when you came in on your chair, there's a connect card. If you would go ahead and fill that out if you're visiting with us. And uh, we have this pretty cool opportunity. Instead of us giving you something for free, some merch that you're not going to use and we're going to see at the Salvation Army, what you can do is that you can choose one of the five local community partners that we have that you can, we'll give $5 to on your behalf. So if you click on one of those boxes, whether it's the Mission, Teen Challenge, or New Hope Opportunities, we will send them $5 on your behalf just to say thank you for being there. And uh, you can also visit our visiting area, our Welcome Center, and do it there as well. But uh, really quick, hey, I just wrote a book. I know we've been talking about that. And the book comes out this month on August uh, 27th. Yes. And so, uh, and I'm excited about this on the 5th of this month. Uh, we're going to have uh, an opportunity here to uh, sell some books, and I'd love to connect with you and sign your book. It'll be worth absolutely nothing, but it'll make me feel better about my... Anyways, but... Nonetheless, I have a free copy today. This is an advanced copy today, and I want to give it to someone, a visitor. So if this is your first time at the Collective Church today, I'm not going to make you recite a haiku or anything like that. But if you are visiting today for the first time, would you slip your hand up? I'd love to give you a book. Is there anybody in the house? My man, I see you all the way in the back with the black polo shirt. Yes, you right there. I see that hand. Yes. Uh, here, why don't you go ahead. Trey, can you uh, bring that up? Where Trey? Oh, no. Can you bring that up? Would you come up, come up, come up? I got this for you. I thought that was Trey sitting next to you, Brad. I made you do the walk of shame, didn't I? He said, you weren't going to make me recite a haiku, but you're going to make me walk in front of everybody. Hey, man, there you go. I'm going to need that back at the end of service. Uh, just kidding. All right, and lastly, I know we made an announcement, but Ashley and I would love to see you at Pizza with the Pastor. It is just your next step here. It'll be a good time. Hey, we're continuing our collection of talks entitled My Money, God's Problem. My Money, God's Problem. This is our third installment. We had uh, Mr. Payne shared our first installment. Can we give it up for John Payne, ladies and gentlemen, for sharing with our church? I shared last week, this will be part three. The title of today's talk, if you're taking notes, is Trust Issues. Trust Issues. None of us have trust issues. Amen. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 10 says this. Trust in the Lord with what? With all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he's going to show you which path to take. That will preach right there. Verse 7. Now, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain. Your vats will overflow with good wine. Let us pray. Lord, once again, we thank you uh, for today. We thank you for your word. It's alive. It's active sharper than a double-edged sword, and I pray that that word today would just penetrate our hearts, Lord Jesus. I pray that over the next few minutes that I would become less and that you would become more, and I'd ask you that the very words that are being spoken in heaven would be spoken here in this room. And so, Lord, wherever we are at on this journey called life, maybe we've been Christians since, like, day one. Uh, maybe this is our church. Maybe it's not. Maybe we knew you at one point, and we fell away, or maybe we're here today, and we don't even believe in God. God, I would just ask that your word would do what it says it's going to do, and that's reap a harvest in our lives. So for the next few minutes, I pray that we would put aside any preconceived notions, any distractions, any, anything that would hinder what it is that you want to speak, and you would speak to us where we are at and give us clarity. I also thank you for our kids, pastors, and all of our servant leaders that are serving our children today, Lord. We're just so grateful for them. Bless them today, Lord. Give them the strength that they need, and I pray that our children would learn about you continuously and the love that you have for them. And lastly, I just thank you for our youth pastors pastors and the youth ministry is going to take place tonight in downtown. We pray a blessing over them. We pray increase over our student ministry. And we just pray that they today, Lord, will learn more about your love. And so we thank you and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. Let's give it up for our worship pastor, Gregorio, ladies and gentlemen. My gosh, fashion icon right there. And um, 
Hey, so uh, I often share stories about my children. I have four children, and uh, my, my parents actually live here, and they're in the front row. My dad gets upset because I tell him that I didn't see him at church on Sundays, and he says I'm sitting in the front row. So I'm going to acknowledge my father that is sitting. I see you, Mario. I see you, Anna. I see the both of you. I, I, all of that good stuff that you owe me lunch. And so... Um, you know, it's really interesting watching them with, my, with their grandkids, with my children. When I watch them with their grandkids, I often reflect on my childhood and how they treated me. And it's always so different. Like, I don't know if you have children right now, if you are a grandparent. You probably spoil your ch- grandchildren rotten and used to beat your children, right? No, I'm just kidding. But, like, I see the way that they are with their grandkids, and I'm like, oh, they look like they love them. What is that like? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I see how they play with them. They get away with everything and anything under the sun. They get whatever they want. There is no no in the vocabulary of grandparents. And so I'm going to tie this into a story. This past weekend, well, actually, today is my wife Ashley's birthday. Happy birthday, First Lady. Don't look a day over 25, girl, but I'm glad you are because that would be weird. And so, um, nonetheless, it was her birthday and so I today. So I took her away for overnight stay. We went to L.A. where we're from and we stayed there and I left my kids with the grandparents. Man, that's a big task. They had like four different school pickups. I had to feed all the children. It was insane, right? And so I get back and we're at my house and my parents have dropped off the kids and we're talking about some of the things that my children did while I was gone for less than 24 hours. And some of the things that they were sharing were things that we normally do not allow them to do at home. You know, that's how it is. When we go to grandpa and grandma's, it's lawlessness. There is no law, right? And so my, I'm sitting there listening to, we stayed up till this time. I had my phone until this time. I came home and picked up this video game thing. I did this. I robbed the bank. Like, all of this stuff is going on. And I'm sitting there looking at my dad like, well, you got suckered, bro. Like, you got hit hard. And I'm thinking like, he's like, well, don't you allow the kids to do this stuff at home? I said, absolutely not. He goes, well, they told me that they are allowed to. And I'm like, since when did you believe a nine-year-old when did you begin but I'm 41 and you don't believe me and so he said well they told me that you allowed them to do that so I trusted them and I said that was your first mistake Mario you trusted my children I don't trust my children that's why we sleep with the door locked and so you trusted my children and they done lied to you Amen. That was my way of confronting in this moment without a therapist. No. But, uh, man, when you think about trust, it's very difficult to trust. We're in that era where we just don't trust anymore just because we're told to trust. There was a generation that they were told what to do. The church told, we trusted you because you were a person of authority. You were a person of leadership. You were a person of some sort of high moral compass. So we trusted you. But the truth is, we don't give away trust that freely anymore. A lot of us have trust issues. Some of you have walked into church today and you don't know if you can trust me. Most of you will not fill out a connect card, although this is your first day. Because you don't know if you can trust our church yet. You don't know if you can trust me yet. You've come here today in hopes that maybe you would discover that that we could be trust. But we don't trust people right away. When you meet someone for the first time, do you trust that person right away? No, they have to grow. Your trust has to grow. Trust is built over time. It's built over relationship. It's very rarely that we trust somebody or something right when we meet them. It takes time. And with that being said, that's what God asks us to do. And I think it's more difficult than what we actually think. He asks us to trust him in all aspects, in every aspect of our life. The good, the good aspects, the bad aspects, the known aspects, the hidden aspects. But he calls us to trust him with every area in our lives. And here's the truth. For those of you who know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have the faith, the trust, and the assurance to believe that Jesus Christ came from heaven, 100% man, 100% God, that he lived on earth, that he carried our shame, that he died on the cross, that he bled, that his blood forgives us of our sins, that he was resurrected after he died on the third day so that we can have life and life forevermore. You trust that. You can take that idea to the bank. It's easy for you. But you know what's what's interesting to me? The thing that we rarely trust God with is our finances. 
I think it's the most difficult area to truly trust God. And we will trust him for healing. We will trust him for some sort of miracle. We will trust him for salvation. But when it comes to finances, I don't know if I'm going to do that third. I don't know if I can fully trust God. And oftentimes you question, can I trust God? Because I've been through some hard financial times knowing God. Because we have this misinformed theology that makes us think that just because we are a Christian... Just because we are children of God, we will never have tough times. We will never go through financial difficulty. We will never go through financial hardship. And because we have this misconceived theology, anytime we go through a season of lack or scarcity, we associate that with God not being with us, so I can't trust God in my finances. But see, then we negate the entire Old Testament in where the Israelites are sent on a journey. But before they start, they start in a season of not enough when they didn't have enough brick and material to make brick to a season of just enough when God would appear to them and provide manna daily to a season of more than enough in the promised land. So the Israelites, God's chosen, even went through seasons of scarcity, hardship, and massive provision. But it didn't mean that God wasn't with them. He would appear as a cloud and they would follow him. So sometimes we think that because maybe financially things were difficult or they are difficult, I don't really know if I can, I'm about to knock this fly out right now in the name of Jesus. I trust God that you're going to kill it in Jesus' name. But yet he calls us to trust him. Here, here's actually what the scripture says, that we are to honor him with our wealth. Number one, in order to honor God with your money, which is what Proverbs declares, You must learn to trust God with your money. Now that word honor, I want to focus on that because in the original language, the definition is this. To be heavy, weighty, and burdensome. So God understands something. Honoring him with your finances is not going to be easy. It comes with a weight. It's almost a burden. It is heavy. He understands that what he is asking you to do, asking me to do, is not easy. He even utilizes language that would declare that it comes with a weight, that it is a hard thing to do. But he calls us to honor him with our wealth. Now, some of you see that word wealth. You're hearing the word wealth, and you're associating it with that pyramid scam you're with. No, I'm just kidding. You're so, so, I don't want to buy your lotion. No, I'm just kidding. But listen, or your food. <laughs> You're associating the word wealth with richness. Wealth is for wealthy people. They're rich people. But that word wealth here that is used does not mean that. It actually means in the Hebrew enough. Sufficient. Sufficiency. So this scripture that I read out of Proverbs verses 8 and 9. It is not for the wealthy. It is not just for those who have a grip of money. The translation for grip means a lot. I'm from the hood, right? It doesn't just mean a a lot. It just means for anyone. For everyone where there is sufficiency. But I think that we struggle to honor him because we struggle to trust. So the question is, how do I honor God with my wealth? How do I do that? What does trust look like? Well, number one, you got to remember what? It's not your money. Last week, if you were here, we talked about stewardship. you got to manage it well. You got to walk in obedience to the principles of giving. And then with the best that you produce, you give to God, not your leftovers. See, the scriptures declare that you honor him with trust, but he calls you to give of your best, not of your scraps and not of your leftovers. And that's oftentimes the thing that we do. We want to give and deal with everything else first financially. And if there's margin, then God, I might give. Then God, I might utilize this for the kingdom of God. You have to understand this as well, that the blessings of wealth are conditional. They're conditional. What's the condition? Listen to this. Honor the Lord your God with your wealth and the best part of everything with your produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. I mean, the guy who wrote Proverbs probably lived in Bakersfield. This is like a lot of farm talk. But listen, it's a conditional promise. Meaning that if you do what he's asking you to do, then you get to receive what's on the latter end of that scripture. So he's saying, look, man, if you honor me with your wealth, if you trust me with your finances, if you give me the first fruits of your labor, if you take care of the house of God to that extent, then I will give you increase. Then I will give you more. Then I will give you more provision. It's not me naming it and claiming it, blabbing it and grabbing it. It's scripture. Oftentimes, this is why we don't give we think to ourselves I will begin to give when I get more money I'm going to begin to give after I get through this season 
I'm going to begin to give once I get that raise. Bubba, if you couldn't give on minimum wage, you ain't going to give when the salary kicks in in that sense. Because then it'll actually be more. And you're not used to giving more because you've never given little. And so if you're faithful with the little, he blesses you with the more. What you sow is what you will reap. And then he multiplies it because that's how kingdom mathematics works. We can't always describe, describe it or understand it. Brings me to my second thought. Wealth is not for you just to keep to yourself. It's given to be a blessing. It's given to be a blessing. Remember what we talked about last week? We said your stewardship. All, everything that you have is not yours. It's God, and he's the one that gives it to you. But he gives it to you to be a blessing. I, I, I briefly went over this scripture, but there's a scripture in the text in the gospel. says, freely you have received, therefore freely you give. Now this is talking within the context of salvation. Freely you have received the message of Jesus. Now freely you go and give that message out. But when you kind of take that into our context, he's saying, I've given something to you. Now I want you to go and give to others. That's how the kingdom works. I have given you freely. Now you go and freely give the very same thing that I have given to you. That's how we are to posture our lives. But keeping Wealth or finances as a follower of Jesus for yourself is really greed. There's actually consequences to greed. This is what the scriptures say. Somebody who got invited today looked to your person and said, man, you really brought me on the money talk day, huh? Oh, that's they did. You must have made them mad, right? Here we go. Luke, 6, or Luke 12, 16 through 21 says this. Then he told them a story. There was a rich man and he had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger ones. And then I'm going to have room enough to store all my wheat and all other goods. Verse 19. And I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, self, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So in this story, in this text, it's about a man who wanted to acquire wealth. Acquiring wealth is not a sin. Desiring to make more money is not a sin. Now, that becomes your idol. That is now a sin. But the desire to have more wealth, it's not a sin. It's what you do with that wealth that you acquire as a follower of Jesus. See, the reason that God called this man a fool is because he kept bringing in wealth. He kept bringing in finances. He kept bringing in money. And his heart was to store it up. His heart was to keep it all for himself and not do anything with it that would bless the kingdom. That's called greed. And so I would present to you, and you can be upset all that you want, but I would present to you that if you know who Jesus is, if you've been coming to church, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a disciple of Jesus and a follower of the way, and you have not been faithful with your giving and your finances, then I would lean on the side to say that maybe there is some greed in that place. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's a lack of trust. There's something but we're not called to keep it to ourselves. Are you still with me? Say amen. amen. I want you to understand money is not evil. Listen to the scriptures. For the love of money is what? It is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the truth, faith, and pierced themselves with many sorrows. See, money is not evil. It's that our heart is wicked and deceitful and can't be trusted. It's what's in our heart and what we do with our money that is evil, not money. Now, I want you to, to know that it's all about your perspective. I'm going to put this chart up, and this is a perspective. We're talking about an owner mentality. If, so if you were here last week, we talked about what being an owner means and what uh, being a, a manager mentality or a renter. Someone who views the kingdom and their church as an owner, this is how they see money. The money I earned belongs to me. Manager mentality says the money I earned belongs to God. When you feel that the money is all yours, you say the ability that I have to work and make money is because of me and my work ethic. Someone who's a good steward would say the only reason I have the ability to work is because of God. Someone who feels that all the money is theirs and they own all their money would think this. I'm not going to give my money to God because I need to make sure I have enough money for myself. Someone who sees themselves as a good steward and a good manager would say I trust God enough to give him back what is already his, and I trust him to always provide for me. Last one, someone who thinks that the money is all theirs says this, it's my money and I can choose to do with it whatever I want. 
Someone who's got a good stewardship mentality says, what I earned is God's money, and because of it, I'm going to manage it well. See, the way that you view money is based on what's rooted in your heart. Scripture says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I oftentimes see that we struggle to view money from a biblical and healthy lens oftentimes because there's this idea or a mentality of poverty. Some people say a spirit of poverty. I say a mentality of poverty because maybe you grew up in a place or in a season of scarcity. Maybe growing up as a child, you saw your parents struggle, and because you saw your parents struggle, you associated finances with the struggle. So the way you view money now is in that same way. You feel like there's never enough, there's never going to be enough, I'm never going to make enough. Do you know that poverty oftentimes is more a mentality than anything else? It's the way that you view your finances, it's the way you view your, it's the way that you view everything. And sometimes God needs to break that mindset in order to shift our mindset and give us the perspective to see money through the lens that he's called us too. Does that make sense? Are y'all still with me today? One person. Golf clap, you all clap. Amen. Let's remember that. Number three is this. As followers of Jesus, we're called to the principle of tithing. We're called to the principle of tithing. What is tithing? What does the word tithe mean? It's a tenth. A tenth or ten percent. When God calls us to tithe, he's calling 10% of our income. And for some of you, you're like, whoa, that's a lot. But I've always said this, man, if you can't live off a of 90, then you can't live off of 100. The beauty is, is that God gives you everything. And out of everything he gives you, he says, all I'm asking you is for 10%. You keep the rest of it. You do what you want to do, boo-boo. You want to get that Louis, get that Louis. You want to get them dunks, get that dunks. You want to buy that boat, buy that boat. But with this 10%, I'm calling you to bring it back to the house of God. Where do we get that scripture from? Great question. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 12 says this. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me because of the tithes and the offering due to me. Because of that, you're under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's army, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I'll pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's army. Then all nations will call you blessed, for the land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's army. What, is this, what does this have to do? Here is a story. God is going to the Israelites, and he's having a conversation with them. And he says, hey, you guys are actually under a curse. How do I get under a curse? It's not just through a witch or richery. It's through obedience. How do we know? Because God says, today I set before you a blessing and a curse. The blessing is for obedience. The curse is for disobedience. So you get to choose. Here's the beauty. You get to choose your destiny as it pertains to being cursed or being blessed. Not just in the area of finance. You want to see the blessings of God in your life? Walk in obedience. You want to see the blessings stop flowing? Walk in disobedience. The choice is yours. He gives you the option. He says, here is A and here is B. If you go down A, you're going to be good. If you go down B, not so good. Oftentimes, we're mad at the devil. We're cursing the devil for our situation. I can picture the devil going, dang, that's not, I can't take credit for that one, dog. <laughs> that's all you, boo-boo. That's all you. Because you made the decision to not walk in obedience. So he's talking to them and he's like, your whole nation is under a curse. What do you mean we're under a curse? How are we under a curse? Because you've been robbing God. Well, how have we been robbing God? You haven't been giving a tenth into where you need to give it to the house of God. See, back in this time, in biblical times, as this text, let me give you some context before you fall asleep. It's this. Back then they would give a tenth. The people of Israel would give a tenth, a tithe, to the Levites. Who were the Levites? The Levites were the tribe and where all the priests came from. These are the ones that ministered before the Lord. These are the ones that took care of the things in the temple. And then what they would do is that they would give a tenth to the Levites. The Levites would then take a tenth and give it to the priests. And every three years, they would take another tithe and they would put it in different cities for the orphans, the widows, and the priests to come and be able to get a part of that. So everything had a reason, everything had a season. You would even take your tenth and you would go to the temple entrance and you would sit with the Levites and you would partake in what you had brought them as a form and an expression of worship. Why do we say giving is an expression of worship? Because when they brought their tithe, they would sit down and they would celebrate and it would be an expression of worship. Also, worship is the way not that you live. 
So the way that you live can either honor God or dishonor God. And the way that we live as it pertains to our finances have the ability to honor him or dishonor him. And he says, you guys are under a curse because you guys aren't obeying this law. And he says, he only says this in this one place in the Bible. He says, don't believe me? Just watch. Test me in this. Go ahead. Test me. Begin to tithe. And if you are still in a bad place after it, then I am not the God that I say that I am. But I want, he said, I wish you would. I wish you could. I wish you would put me to the test in this area. My question is, have, have we put him to the test? If we're ever going to step into a place of trusting God with our finances, it's going to mean that we're going to have to take a step out in faith. And as we take that step out in faith, it means that we're going to have to trust him. And you can test him. Don't test him. You ever, your parents ever say, you better stop testing me with that. You know what that meant. One more act of violence, the belt was coming off in Jesus' name. But he says, hey, this is the only area that you can test me. And he says, watch, let me prove to you. You don't believe me, just watch. And so oftentimes we hinder ourselves from stepping in to the blessings that God has for us because we're holding the blessings that we have for someone else. Are you still with me? Thank you. Front Rob, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm a number one fan right here. I love that. So why do I, why should I tithe? Why do I tithe? Why do I tithe? I'm glad you asked. Ten things. This is why I tithe. I tithe to provide for the work of the Lord. I tithe to provide for the needs of others. I tithe to prove his faithfulness. I tithe as a result of his faithfulness. I tithe as an expression of worship. I tithe as an act of obedience. I tithe to kill the greed within me. I tithe to show that I trust him. I tithe because it's better to give than receive. And I tithe as a response to his goodness in my life. That is a good place to give him praise. If all he did was die on the cross and be resurrected for me, it'd be enough. But he doesn't stop there. He continues to pour out his blessings. He continues to give. He continues to pour out on your behalf. And my thing is, if you've been blessed, you want to know if you're blessed? If you are alive in this room and you have air in your lungs and if you are breathing, you are blessed. I'd rather, I'm blessed to be a blessing. It's better to give than it is to receive. Do you know that only 20% Americans, 20% of American Christians of a church tithe? Only 20, that means the other 80% get to come into church, enjoy the benefits and the fruit of a garden that they did not tend to on the behalf of someone else's 20% that they give to the church. So if there is almost 370 people in this room that would say 20% of that who call themselves Christians and come to this church would give. And so my question is, who's robbing who? When, when the scripture says you rob the house of God, you're also robbing yourself of your blessing. There is something that happens in you when you begin to give and you begin to live to that capacity. And you begin to say, God, use me. You've blessed me so that I'm going to be a blessing. But greater than that, I'm going to walk in obedience to what you're calling me to. So it's what he calls us to. It's really not optional. It's either you do or you don't. Why do I struggle? Trust. You know, uh, we're, our church is going to celebrate three years, I think, in November. And uh, to the glory of God. Church planting is not easy um, past, a, a, any capacity, but it's what God has called us to do. I've done it twice. You think I'm crazy. I am. Um, but I remember when my wife and I felt that it was time to transition from our last church. And it was the dumbest time to transition in, in all aspects. From the outside looking in, naturally, it was the most stupid time to transition from anywhere. It was in the middle of the pandemic. But I'm like, we felt the Lord release us. And I'm like, God, what are you releasing me to? And he's like, don't worry about it. I'm like, I'm worried, God. I'm worried. <laughs> I got four kids and a wife. And I remember we took this step of faith, and to so some people they would be like, that's stupid, but imagine when, Mo, imagine when Noah was building a boat and when it had never rained before, people said he was stupid too. Sometimes we forget people that we're in the business of faith, not everything being aligned before we take a step of faith. And so we had to, we took this step of faith. You know what, some of you, let me tell you something, you, you don't take a step of faith until God moves. You're like, when I move, you move. He's like, no, when you move, I move just like that. 
And some of you, I just, some of you are waiting for all the stars to line up before you take a step of faith. And maybe God is saying to you, the stars won't line up until you take that step of faith. Because you're not walking by faith, you're walking by sight. And so we, we resign. And I am doing, it's in my book, and I'm doing everything I can. Shameless plug, I don't care. I'm doing everything I can to try to find a job. I'm not going back to church. I don't want to work at the church anymore. I don't want to be a pastor anymore. I, don't, I want to be a Toys R Us kid. I just I don't want to do that. And I'm applying everywhere, and nobody's calling me back. I even applied to be the greeter at the gym that I go to, and they were like, no. I'm like, I would kill it in hospitality, man. I'd crush it. I'd greet five, thank five, engage one in a conversation. That's what we do here at the Galactive. And I'm like, how are we going to provide for our family? I remember we were in the living room one day. I had no job. We had been tithing faithfully. Here's the thing. You want to tithe today and see your blessing tomorrow. When you sow seed, you don't reap immediately. You reap later on. So the, tears, the seed that you've been sowing, you might not reap today, but there will be uh, interest on it on the payback. We're watching some sermon online, and we're sitting there, and I'm like, what are we going to do? And I don't know what happened that my wife got up and went to the front door, and there was a whole array of groceries that somebody had left at our front door. We don't know who to this day brought us groceries, but they brought us groceries. And then after that, we received a phone call where another lady said, I want to take you to Costco so you guys can go shopping. When we went to Costco, my wife grabbed one cart. She's like, what are you doing? You need an extra cart too. She's like, if we need three, we'll grab three carts. I'm like, dang, balling on a budget. Let's go. You should have taken four. And what I saw is that every step of the way, in this process, in our obedience, and in our faithfulness, was a step that God was reminding me that he was with me. That he was going to take care of us. Now you could say, well, that's just what God does. But could it possibly be that all those times that Ashley and I sacrificed and we gave in our tithe, that we gave above and beyond, we were sowing seed into the kingdom. And now in this place, we were reaping from that very thing. That's also the other aspect. We struggle to give financially because we want to return right away. We want to see that return right away. And here's the truth. God moves how he wants to move when he wants to move. Why do we struggle to tithe? We don't trust the church. That's another one. Sometimes it's because we don't manage our personal finances well. There's some people in Christians who believe that tithing isn't relevant. So my question is, how does the work of the kingdom continue to move forward if giving is not relevant? Worship team, if you can begin to come so they think I'm closing. You know it's been good when my dad said to me, man, you ended on time lately. And I'm like, I don't know how to take that. Um, this is what he says, verse 10. Try it. Put me to the test. Try it. Put me to the test. Number four is this. God doesn't need our money, but he chooses to invite us into his kingdom work through tithing. This is the beauty. God invites us. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need us. But he chooses to partner with creation. And he invites us into his kingdom work. And he says, hey, come be a part of this. Hey, come be a part of what we're doing. Isn't there something beautiful when you sow a financial seed into the place that's the house of worship and you see God moving every Sunday and you see 13, 15, 20 people saying yes to Jesus and you see people at the altar and you see children worshiping and singing. So that, should, that should give you a sense of excitement and encouragement to say, man, I had a part in that because I'm giving to that. Second Corinthians says this, remember this, that whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. When you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly, and when you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. Verse 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. 
The definition of the word abundantly is to be in abundance, to provide in abundance, to have more than enough, excessive, cause to be more, have greater advantage. The word abound is to be over and above. When you take the definition of those two words and you actually plug it into verses eight, this is how it reads. And God is able to bless you. How? In abundance, provide in abundance, give you more than enough, in excessiveness, cause you to be more and have greater advantage. Why? So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will be over and above in every good work. He is the God who supplies all of our needs according to his riches and his glory. Man, I can't say that um, every season has been easy financially. I can't say that every season has been one of those seasons where it feels like uh, a hyperbole uh, land flowing of milk and honey. But what I do know and what I can attest and what I can say about the faithfulness of God is Ashley and I have never gone without. He's provided for all of our needs according to his riches and his glory. And we've continued to put him to the test. Every week that we give, we're putting him to the test. Every week that we give online, we're putting him to the test. Saying, God, I want to honor you with this trust and believe that you're able to do something with this. And God loves a cheerful giver. When somebody gets up here and they do an offering talk, we don't want you to ever feel like you have to give under compulsion or reluctantly. God says it's better, basically it's better that you don't give with that heart than give at all. If you're going to give, give with a heart that's cheerful. If you're going to give, give with a heart that desires to. If you're going to give, don't let it be out of compulsion, but let it be because the Spirit of God has convicted you through the word of truth to walk in obedience to the giving principle. Because the way that we give, the posture of our heart in our giving is just as big as if not bigger than our giving in a sense. And so our heart has to be in alignment. I wanted to challenge us today, if you could put that slide up. Maybe you've been following Jesus and you've been coming to church and maybe this whole giving thing is new to you or maybe you've never sat on this. And so some of you maybe who've never give to hear this idea of giving 10% is such an extreme. I would challenge you in this. If you've never given at the collective or to a church that you're from, here's a challenge to you. Begin to give something. If you want to get in the habit of giving, begin to give something. Just give a dollar, 50 cents, something where we can get a, a value meal at McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? Something. I'm just kidding. And then secondly, maybe you have given, but begin to give something regularly. You're conditioning yourself and you're preparing yourself to be able to walk in this. If you give, give, give regularly and see what that begins to do in your heart and begins to do in your life. And then if you've been doing that, I say go to number three, begin to tithe. Tithe, tithe once. Put him to the test. Tithe and give once. And once you see that he's faithful and he still provides for all of your needs according to your riches and glory, hey, why don't you begin to tithe regularly? Hey, you know what, this thing, this thing I'm feeling good, I don't know, I'm seeing the blood. I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin to make this a habit of my life. Just like going to church, just like praying, I'm gonna throw this into the spiritual rhythms of my life. And then once you do that, I'd even challenge you to give generously above and beyond. One of our core values here at the Collective Church is generosity is a way of life. You can't walk in generosity until you first walked in obedience to the principle of tithing. And for the Christians who say, well, tithing is not in the New Testament, so I'm not going to buy into that. Give to Caesars what is Caesars and give to God's what is God's. But if you don't believe in it, then you need to start believing in generosity because the New Testament church, they sold their possessions. They sold their house to give to each other's needs to progress the kingdom and the gospel message moving forward. They didn't walk in just the bare minimum. They gave above and beyond. So if you don't believe in the tithe and you believe in generosity, then blessed be the name of the Lord. Walk generously. But as, that is, as a church, that's what God is calling us to do. I don't know about you, but do you like your black seats? They're kind of comfy, said no one ever. 
But I believe the collective church one day will have its own building. I believe the collective church one day will be able to send out pastors from this place and plant more campuses. We'll have a better space for our children, a better space for our youth. We'll be able to support more missionaries and more kingdom work around our city and around the world. Why? Fuel through the obedience and giving from you. That's what he calls us to. And then lastly, if you'd stand to your feet, you sat down on a, on a 90 day tithe challenge card. There's a green card, if you wouldn't mind grabbing it, even if you don't, want, uh, just look at it for a second. It just makes me feel good about myself. That's a joke. We did this last year at the collective and we heard how it blessed so many people and blessed the collective. But this is what we're gonna challenge you to do. If you call this place your home church, I'm gonna challenge you after these three weeks of having a conversation about finances, stewardship, I think next week it's on generosity. I'm gonna ask you to prayerfully consider would you commit to a 90 day tithe challenge? Hey, for 90 days, I'm gonna test God in this thing and I'm gonna give faithfully of my tithes and see what he does. After 90 days, if it didn't work, you'll get your money back. No, I'm just kidding, I don't know about that one. Then you talk to God. What is this, is this a gimmick? Nope. Is this, is this you're just trying, no. I'm just trying to get you in the habit and take a next step in your discipleship journey. And I would even challenge you, if you've already been giving and you've already been tithing regularly, I would ask you to fill that card out anyways. Just as a sign to let us know, hey, we're in this together. We're gonna talk about this next week again, but our 90 day tithe is gonna begin September 1st and it's gonna end on December 1st. And we're gonna see what the Lord is gonna do. And we're gonna see how the Lord sets us up for next year to do what he wants to do. So we're gonna sing a song. If you feel called to do it, we invite you to fill it out. And after church on the way out, there's two giving areas. You can just drop it in there. If you wanna take it home and pray and have a conversation, that's absolutely fine. Our heart in this church's heart is not to take your money for the greater good of ourselves. It's to receive the blessings that God has provided so that we can be a blessing in this city and all around. With every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're in this place and maybe your finances are struggling this morning. Maybe you, you don't even know, you don't have a job. I don't know when the next check is gonna come. Maybe you've been struggling with your finances. I'm not gonna call you up. I just wanna pray. I just felt led to pray for those who are struggling financially. Maybe it's been hard. Maybe you've been living paycheck to paycheck. Maybe you're sitting here listening and saying, I don't even know that I can do that because I don't even know where my next check is coming from. But you're in a place right now where maybe you've been in financial hardship and you just want me to pray for you right where you're at with every head bowed, every eye closed. Would you lift up your hand so that we can agree with you? Thank you, 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 thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? You can go ahead and put your hands down. I'm going to sing. We're going to close in worship as an opportunity to response. You know, Lena preached on worship and she talked about the altar. This altar is just a place where you can respond, even if it's for something different. I invite you to not just let this be a moment where you just stand in there, but let it be a moment where you're responding in worship. And maybe it is up here at the altar. So I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. And then we'll dismiss you. Lord, we thank you for today. You saw the hands that went up and said, hey, finances are tight. There's some financial hardship. There's some challenges going on. Lord, you own a cattle on a thousand hills. Lord, you have the ability to turn the impossible into the possible. Father, I pray that every hand that was lifted, that you would give them a peace that surpasses all understanding. When there is scarcity, it brings anxiety. When there's anxiety, it brings confusion. God, I pray against any confusion. I pray against any anxiety right now in the name of Jesus. And I just pray that you would calm the raging waters in their heart and to be still. God, I pray that you would provide for those needs of those who raise their hands according to your riches. The Bible says that never have your children been begging for bread. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open the door. I pray that you would bring blessings this week. I pray that you would turn the situation around like never before, Lord Jesus, and that you would move and that you would be glorified. And I pray for those who are considering or those who are taking the 90-day challenge. 
God has put you to the test over the course of the next three months. I pray that you would not just meet them at their level of expectation, but that you would supersede their expectations, that you would blow their minds at your goodness and your faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said.